Good morning, good morning everyone, you beautiful rays of sunshine. Brian Post here and welcome to session 10. We are just cranking along here. Hope you guys have been enjoying the class. I have been enjoying sharing it with you. And I am ready for another fantastic morning of education. As we continue forward, push forward in breaking down the understanding the why and the what of love-based parenting, also known as reclaim parenting. So that's my new that's my new moniker for my mainstream parenting is reclaim parenting. And so as we get into session 10 of our 16 week adoption parenting coaching and certification course, I hope everyone has been able to assimilate a great deal of this information. You've been able to apply it into your homes, to your life, to your family, and that it is making a difference. Because ultimately, that is what it's all about. Just making a difference and helping us feel more loving and more understanding. So I'm recording from my office this morning. I typically record from home. But for some reason, I felt compelled. I, it, it's easy for me to get distracted. And as long as the family is up and around on a Saturday morning and I've got a new little puppy, so it's easy for me to get distracted when there's other noise. And so I knew there would be no one down at the office. So I brought myself on down to the office, which is not far from where we live, actually. So I'm driving down. And we drive down the road. It's kind of this back road. And there's a park. And so there's a walking trail and a riding trail so lots of people are, are usually on there walking and riding their bikes and I noticed the husband and wife they're riding their beach bikes and, and it's a curvy little trail and so he's whizzing by and, and this is just this is just how my mind works and in and, and some ways I feel like I want to help you all to look at things in a similar way especially when it comes to children. But they're they're kind of whipping along on those curves, and he's got this bald-headed guy. He's got this big old smile on his face. It is a smile of joy and happiness. He is enjoying himself. And his wife is right behind him by about, you know, 10 feet or so. And she's keeping up the same pace, but she's seemingly keeping up you know, the, the, the trying to keep up with him. And she's got a big old smile on her face. But with a second glance, her face is filled with anxiety. Her teeth, there's a big old smile, but her teeth are clenched tight, and her eyes are wide, and she is trying to keep up, and she is hoping she doesn't fall, and she is wondering why in the heck is he going so fast, and why won't he slow down? And I am certain that if he turned around and looked at her face, he would think she was having the time of her life. But I'm also certain that not, ha not only has this, this has not only been a, a, uh, an anxiety-provoking experience for her, with some level of joy because, you know, she's with her husband and, and it's a Saturday, a beautiful Saturday morning and they're feeling good about one another, but underlying the anxiety is, is the exhaustion of her window of tolerance. So here's what's going to happen later in the day. Or maybe even later this morning. She's going to become pretty fed up with him. And all the stress from this ride this morning, this, this, this wonderful ride, and again, he's thinking that they're having the time of their lives. The stress from that is going to catch up. Her window of tolerance is going to be exhausted. And he's going to say something that in other times he probably would have said, not necessarily should have said, but he's going to say something, and it's going to go all over her. And the anxiety, the window of tolerance wearing down that began this morning is going to erupt into a big old nasty argument. And their beautiful Saturday morning ride is going to go right up in flames. And he's going to wonder to himself, it started out such a beautiful day, what happened? And she's going to wonder to herself, it started out such a beautiful day, what happened? And that is the power of nonverbal communication. Alan Shore says the core of the self is 
unconscious and nonverbal and lies in patterns of affect regulation. I've said that before. It's been a quiz question before. It simply means it's not what you say or do, it's how you feel when you are doing and saying it. It's not what you say or do, it's how you feel when you are doing and saying it. And that is probably one of the most challenging communication dynamics that exists. Because we are conditioned, not only have we been conditioned not to express ourselves, because you, you go back to the three emotional pathways. Attitudes are suppressed, feelings are suppressed, behaviors are suppressed, you got anger and depression behaviors. So not only are we conditioned to not express ourselves, but as we work through the, the conditioning of being unable to express ourselves, we also, in the moment-to-moment -moment interactions, because we are highly unconscious of how we are feeling, because we are highly unconscious of, of, of the thought processes that are going on, and we do not express our authentic selves in the moment-to-moment -moment experiences. And that's just saying, being able to say, you know what, I feel really stressed out because half the time we don't even know that we're really stressed out, and we are. That's just being able to say, you know what, I feel really disconnected. I feel really shut down. And I don't know what to do about it. But I don't necessarily expect you to fix it, but I, I just want to communicate that this is where I'm at. And so I probably just need to, to go have some quiet time. See, that is difficult communication when you have not learned that it is okay to be able to express your attitudes and your feelings. Very difficult. So, I had that little experience this morning. Just thought I would share that with you because I feel like it ties in. And when it comes to your children and being fantastic dynamic parents, I want you to pay attention to the subtle cues, not only within your children, but within yourself. I want you to begin looking at the subtle cues, listening for the subtle cues, you know, being mindful. And that's one of the first things we're going to talk about as we continue, and I believe we will conclude our parenting the parenting portion of the 16 weeks this morning. We've, we've spent a lot of time going through some of these dynamics, so I, I think that this may be, this may be the, the morning. Let me find my, oops, find my little pen back up here, understanding what works and why. Quick little refresher. We got stress, emotion, and brain development. You know, the, the Part that is most important here is looking at the amygdala. You know, the amygdala is fight, flight, or freeze. How the amygdala pumps out cortisol. And when the, the hippocampus, now when the pituitary gland, when the pituitary gland senses the cortisol and the, and the hypothalamus senses the cortisol, it's supposed to release oxytocin. Oxytocin is supposed to create the balance in the brain to allow us to calm down. But when it doesn't, there is an imbalance of cortisol and oxytocin, and therefore the person stays completely stressed out. And ultimately, when that happens, the hippocampus gets flooded, short-term memory is shut down, um, and, and the, the cortisol continues to flood the brain. Our, thinking, our thinking becomes confused and distorted, and then from that perspective, our orbital frontal cortex is knocked offline, not working effectively, therefore our social and emotional interactions are going to be impaired. And our behavior is going to not be very pretty. That's how it works, folks. It's as simple as that. That is Refresher 101. Stress, emotion, and brain development. Refresher 101. I want, I want you to be able to memorize it word for word. I want you to get it. I want you to have it in your head. At any given time, you re return to that framework all the time. How do you get that? How do you get 
to that place to where that is your paradigm. How do you accomplish that? How do you get to the place to where this information becomes a part of your paradigm? What two things are required for changing the brain? Who can, who can answer that this morning? What two, thi what two things are required for changing the brain? Any takers? Repetition and emotional impact. Repetition and emotional impact. Two things required for changing the brain. So how do you make this information second nature? Repetition or emotional impact. How have I made it second nature? Repetition and emotional impact. What's my repetition been? For the last 15 years, I have studied laboriously. I have read laboriously. I have you know, practice, I have taught, I have written about this, the subject matter. And I feel like I, I've still not yet mastered it. I know the basics, I know the foundation, and I believe that when we, when we have a solid foundation, everything else is just structural. When we have a solid foundation, everything else is, is just details. So that's so much of what I want to do is create a foundation for you because I believe when you create the foundation, everything else makes sense. And, and the things that don't make sense, you understand why they don't make sense because, because you have an informed foundation. So, you know, I quote Alan Shore all the time. I've, I've read all three of Alan Shore's volumes on affect regulation. That's, that's repetition. Alan Shrove's stuff. Daniel Goldman's stuff, Daniel Siegel's stuff, Bruce Perry's stuff, John Kabat-Zinn's stuff, Bruce Lipton's stuff, the stuff, the stuff, the stuff. I read the stuff. Why do I read the stuff? I read the stuff for repetition. Why am I spending so much time talking to you about this right now? Because not enough people spend time talking to you about what it takes, what it takes to truly change your brain so that you can do something different when it comes to your child. You cannot take a course. You cannot read a book. You cannot listen to a guru, a therapist, a preacher, a teacher, whoever it is. You cannot listen to a person and then, and then believe that that is going to be suitable to changing your paradigm because it's not. You must have repetition, and then you must have the emotional impact. See, in so many ways, the stress that you encounter is essential because that, that establishes opportunities for emotional impact. That's when you oftentimes want to quit. That's oftentimes when you want to give up. That's oftentimes when you want to revert and do things, you've all, do things the same way you've always done, but that's when you have to dig in and not stop. That's, how, that's when you have to dig in. You have to really challenge yourself to look at the dynamics that are going on from, from an outside perspective, from a, a mindfulness, from a bird's eye view. You have to be able to take the bird's eye view. You have to be able to look at it. You have to watch what's unraveling. You have to be able to listen. You have to be able to dissect. You have to be able to breathe through the experience and then learn from it. Repetition and emotional impact. How did my emotional impact begin? Let me tell you. Well, it, it began long, long ago. But let me tell you about the first time I was really in a situation where I experienced emotional impact. My first mentor, my first real attachment mentor was Martha Welch. Martha Welch wrote a book years ago called Holding Time, 20 years ago. It's amazing that's been that long. 
She's a psychiatrist, was a psychiatrist. I lost track of Martha many years ago at Columbia University in uh, New York. And I picked up one of Martha's books. Well, actually, let me backtrack because I went to an attached conference, the, uh, the Association for the Attachment and Treat Treatment of Children. And I picked up a Foster Klein book, and I picked up a Martha Welch book. Let me write those down for you. Where you at, PN? Where you at? It's Foster Klein and Martha Welch. Let's, let's, let's check the slides here. So. Yeah, Foster Klein and Martha Welch. Now, Foster was one of the parents of Love and Logic. Martha was one of the father. Was one of the parents. Of, of modern day attachment therapy. Now, if you're not aware, Love and Logic is is not only a, a parenting approach; it's also a, a teaching, an educational teaching approach. But in many ways, it is the parenting approach that was spawned from Foster Klein's attachment therapy approach. So these, these were both Foster and, and Martha during the um, 90s, for sure, were, were considered the attachment therapy gurus. And like I said, Foster, he created, he, with, along with Jim Fay, he created Love and Logic. And then Martha created holding time. Well, Foster used he he Foster pioneered an approach called rage reduction. He actually learned this from a psychiatrist named Zaslow Zaslov. Zaslov used a form of forced holding, um, eliciting, eliciting a holding, a physical holding a, a therapy that would elicit emotion and rage that he practiced on um, schizophrenic patients. And Foster Klein studied under him, and then Foster Klein used this approach, um, which was termed rage reduction, uh, and, and for children with, uh, re with reactive attachment disorder. Because he, he kind of pioneered, pioneered that theory as well, because John Bowlby, Mary Ainsworth, they never labeled anything reactive attachment disorder. Um, so I could be off of my science there, but I think Foster Klein is, is one of the kind of one of the pioneers of, rea of the, the term reactive attachment disorder. Because the, the other gurus, they never talked about uh, reactive attachment disorder, they just talked about attachment styles, insecure attachment, ambivalent attachment, uh, avoidant um, attachment and disorganized attachment, and then secure attachment. So those were the four the four attachment styles. Let's see: secure, ambivalent, and we're not going to talk about all these. Avoidant. Just giving you some background. Disorganized. It's good to be a student of whatever discipline you choose to practice. Um, it is, it's good to be a student. It's good to have mentors. And, and you want to be a student because you will, if you commit yourself to the study of that discipline, you will eventually master that discipline. But you must be willing to be a student of it.
And that's where the repetition comes into place. You must be willing to, to, to go into it with all you've got. So I was at the Attach conference, and um, I think probably most of you are familiar with Attach. Um, I was on the board of directors, most of you probably don't know this, but I was on the board of directors of Attach in the late 90s and um, early 2000s. So Attach is the, and I haven't been to an association for the treatment and training of attachment in children. I haven't been to an attached conference in years. I feel I think the last one I went to was in uh, North Carolina, Greenville, Greenville, South Carolina, and that's where I met Sir Richard Bowlby. And that's also the the last time. The last time I saw pre previous to that was the last time I saw one of my dear friends, Linda Isley. She was a board member on attached, and she. This was a, a young, healthy woman. I, I just absolutely adored and loved her. And she caught spinal meningitis and died within a couple weeks. And so when I came and spoke at that last attached conference. I dedicated my, my talk to her. Um, so she is still missed to this day, and I'm sure her family still misses her tremendously. But she was a, a dynamic, powerful woman. So... Previous to that, some years, some years previous to that, I had went to an attached conference um, in the 90s, and I picked up a book, <sighs> Societal, I think this is the title, Societal Mayhem and um, Consciousless Children. It's something like that. I picked up two books. And then I picked up Holding Time by Foster and, and, and Martha. And I went back and I started reading these books. I also picked up an audio, a couple audio programs from Martha. Mind you, I didn't know anything about attachment at this time. Um... I was just working as a therapist, working with kids, pretty much just making it up as I went along. I owned my own clinic um, at that time. I was 25 years old. I was 25 years old, and I owned my own clinic, and, you know, we were doing play therapy, and we were doing talk therapy, and um, doing points and rewards, and all that business, and I even, you guys will find this, this funny, for those of you who know what Love and Logic is, I even did a seminar at a local school on Love and Logic. <laughs> what do you think of that? Like I said, you've got to be a student. You have to be a student of any discipline, and you do not be fearful of reading any book. Do not be fearful of going to any seminar. Because you, you must go through a process of learning, learning uh, for you, what works and what doesn't, and why. That's the key. Why? Why do you do these things? Ask yourself that question. Why? What is the philosophy behind it? What is the discipline behind it? What is the understanding behind it? And look at it from a from an adoption parenting point of view. I want you to look at it from the brain. I want you to look at it from the perspective of love and fear. I want you to look at it from the perspective of stress. I want you to look at it from the perspective of relationship. I want you to look at it from the perspective of oxytocin. I want you to break it down. I want you to understand when you are doing things which are counter to healing versus when you are doing things which are fostering and encouraging healing. I want you to look at that. I want you to be a student because I want you to master this information. Because when you master this information in your heart and in your mind and in your soul, then you are then pushing forth love in the universe. And we are not always perfect. We don't always get it right, but you will always return back to the, the understanding of the discipline, and that's what's going to allow you to repair the, the attachment when it's been strained.
And that's going to create a stronger attachment. And then those seeds that you're going to be planting for your child, they're going to sow in the world in their relationships. That is my single biggest hope and, 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 and dream is that you take this information not necessarily to, to transform your life and your family today, although I know it can, but that you will teach your child systematically a process of understanding themselves at an unconscious level so they can be more conscious so that when they move into adulthood and they move into relationships, they can make better decisions and choices. Ultimately, so that they can learn to take responsibility. Because this is not what we are typically taught. We are not taught how to take responsibility for our actions. We're just not. We're taught how to be reactive. Taught how to be reactive. So... I picked up two books and I went back and I immediately dove into Foster Klein's book. I was reading Foster Klein's book on a plane. I was going somewhere I can't remember. I was reading it and I got to the part of him talking about rage reduction and I said, you know what? I said in my in my mind, I said I'm going to try this as soon as I got back. As soon as I got back, Monday morning, I had a scheduled session with a really difficult child. I brought the family in. Just as Foster instructs in the book, I put the parents behind a one-way mirror. I went in the room with the child. I put the child on the, I was on the floor, put the child in my arms, and I was getting him into his feelings, and I was nudging, I was knuckling his ribs a little bit, putting a little pressure on his ribs to elicit some, some upset emotions, and I was holding him, and I was, you know, I was, I was doing rage reduction therapy as Foster Klein taught it. And I, I was getting after it, and his parents were watching it, and we went through the session. And I'm, I'm writing about the middle of the session, and you know what I start thinking? Listen to this. Yuck. This is not congruent with me. I don't like this. This doesn't feel very good. Right in the middle of my very first rage reduction session. Mind you, I've been teaching love and logic. So, for me, had that been consistent, had that been consistent, here's 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 what, and, and you might want you might want to know why why it didn't work. Because it was not consistent with my own emotional experience. Me holding a child, trying to elicit emotion from that child, was not consistent with my own emotional experience as a child. I knew in my core that his parents behind the window were as much responsible for his dynamics, his healing dynamics, as anyone. They were more responsible than anyone. And I was interfering, ultimately, in the process of the family healing. And so we finish up the session. I brought the parents in, we wrapped it up nice and tidy, they, you know, were, they didn't know what to think, they were just, you know, going off of what they, what I was telling them. So they were mostly happy, and I said, you know, I'll see you back here next week. And that was the last time I ever held a child. So that didn't feel very good to me, that didn't work very well, so I went home and I immediately dug into holding time. And I was driving somewhere, and I was listening to the audios. And literally, it's amazing and interesting how God lines things up for you. I mean, it, it, it is perfect, of course, because God is perfect. Literally, the next morning, a mother comes in. I'm in the office at 7.30 in the morning. She comes in in a red robe, and her she has red hair, and it is sticking up 
all over the place. And she comes in the office. I'm the first one there. And she just walks in. And I hear the door close. And I'm sitting there. She walks in, walks into my little office. And if you've ever been in an office with me, you know I usually don't have the bright lights on. I usually only have a lamp. And she just sits right down next to my desk. And I'm like, okay, well, what's going on here? And I said, what can I do for you? And she said, this is it. These were her exact words. This is it. If this doesn't work, he's got to go. And I said, okay. She was talking about her seven-year-old son, Casey. Casey Kahn. And he had been in residential treatment. He had been um, on medication. He'd been kicked out of school. He had been, been through so many, so many different treatments. And I said, all right. Well, I listened to her tell me the story a little bit. And I said, you guys come back on um, like Thursday evening. So it was like a couple of days later, we'll do a session. Right? <laughs> she said, okay. And she left, and guess what I did? I dug into holding time, and I started reading it, and I started assimilating, and I started learning. And they came in on Thursday night. We went back to the back office. We got out on the floor. Martha's holding time style is different than foster clients because Martha didn't believe in therapists doing the holdings. She believed in the parents doing the holdings. So essentially the child lays down on his back on the mat. The parent one parent lays on top of the child, the other parent lays right beside the child, and then the parents uh, try to elicit the child's emotion. They release through conflict, and then you're supposed to get in a lot of confrontation. Conf I, I lost it for just a moment. Confrontation. So the parents start, the mom's on top of the child, and she says, I am so angry and she said I can't take it anymore and I I we got to do better than this and I you I need you to tell me how you feel and the child is you know at this point a little bit in shock he's struggling a little bit and then mom says tell me how angry you are and the child starts you know yelling how angry and that that you go from confrontation to conflict so then you get right in the middle of all this intense Rah, rah, rah. I mean, it's like, you know, yelling and screaming and crying and this goes on. This can go on for for hours. I mean, I, I we we did this. I studied with Martha for several years and we did holding sessions all over the United States. Um and we we would do big, big intensives. And this is where I learned the dynamics of my parenting camp and my my, fa my multi-family camps. And so that first session went on, it was about two and a half hours. And that family was exhausted and the child was calm because that's the last stage is resolution. So you get to resolution, you get to the breakthrough, everyone feels better. And I was sold. I was like, this is the most powerful thing I've ever, I've ever experienced as a therapist. And the thing about this, why, now why was that congruent? That was congruent with my emotional experience because for me, it matched my emotional intensity. And it lined up with the conflict that I experienced in my own home. Except the conflict that I experienced in my own home usually ended in violence. So I was, from an unconscious place, I was able to watch this somewhat violent, the energy is very violent, somewhat violent therapeutic process unravel and then unravel into a calm resolution. So I was able to replay my own violence experience in my home, which did not end in any kind of resolution, but it just ended in more fear and stress and trauma. I was able to watch this unfold and end in this resolution, and it felt really good. Felt really good. So, <clears throat> we had that session, and literally the next morning, so I told you guys that we're probably going to finish our, our parenting module, and, and obviously we're probably not because I'm not going to talk about that unless we get to it. So 
settle in and relax and you don't even have to take any notes today. Just giving you some background, giving you some history because, I, like I said, be a student. Be a student of any discipline you decide to follow. And that's, that's in part why I share about myself. That's why I share about my history. That's why I started our classes sharing about myself. And as we're, as we're talking about parenting, I believe this is so very important. I want you to understand my own process in, in, coming, in coming to the, the, the pulling together of this information. So the next morning after the session, and I had another one of my psychotherapy mentors who is a supervisor, doing supervision with the other ther therapists in our office. I had him there that evening. So he, you know, he kind of watched it. He was kind of blown away. And, I mean, it was way outside of his emotional uh, matching. I mean, I was, you know, I played football in college. And so being really intense and then growing up in my home was pretty normal. But, um, yeah, I was, I was sold. So the next morning... 7.30 in the morning, I pulled out the holding time book and found the number to the Mothering Center in, in Chautauqua, um, New York, Greenwich Village, New York, and I called the, the number, and um, I said, good morning. You know, someone answered. I said, good morning. My name is Brian Post. I want to talk to uh, Dr. Welch, and she said, this is Dr. Welch, and I was a little speechless for a moment. I said, well, I've been reading your holding time book and I've done a holding time session and I need to learn more. She's like, well, good for you. Well, I'll meet you in Kansas City in three weeks. I said, well, I'll be there. And I got the details and literally that's how it happened. That was my, that's how my relationship with Martha started. And, and it was for those several years, it was a very close, close relationship because I have the, I still have the utmost respect for the woman. She has, a, you know, at that time, like I said, we we lost touch, and I'll explain that in a minute. We lost touch, and I don't know what she's doing these days, but I still have a great deal of respect for her because she was doing something that no one else was doing. And her approach was the first approach that was the contrast to love and logic because up until that point, everyone had been doing consequences. Everyone had been doing a therapist holding, and this still exists today. This divide in, in the field of attachment still exists. But there's really not a divide, and I'm going to explain that. That's the interesting thing. But ultimately, in Attached, there was a divide. There were those therapists who followed Foster Klein's love and logic approach and followed his, his therapy model. And then there were even, there was a very fewer, but the other side of that, the contrast to, to love and logic was holding time, was Martha's approach, because her parenting was different. Her parenting was more about attunement. It was more about affection. It was, it was more about um, attention. You know, that was her, I think those were her three A's, attention, attunement, and affection. And so her whole parenting model was based around that, and it was based on it was based around you know creating interactions for repair. So when your child is having behavior, you know you go and you get them on the ground, you hold them, and you get their feelings out. Because Martha was not about suppressing feelings; she was about releasing feelings. So once you got to the place to where you could release those feelings, then you could very quickly get to resolution, which was uh, lowering stress, lowering cortisol. That's, that was the whole process. That was the entire process. And Martha talked a little bit about oxytocin. But she didn't really, she didn't really, she didn't really delve into it. It, it was, she mentioned it. She would mention it because she knew, and this woman was a genius. She knew that oxytocin played a role but she, she hadn't quite locked it in. And I, I think I understand why. And it, 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 it's because the, the, of the model itself. And, but we'll talk about that. So I went and went to, drove to Kansas City and participated in intensives. And so that brings me back to the first really emotional, the first really emotional moment, the emotional impact moment was when I held that child in practice reintroduction. That was the first emotional impact moment of changing my paradigm. Then when I went to Kansas City, I was working with a couple. First time I'd have, you know, ever been in intensive. I'd done the session, but first time I'd ever been in an intensive session. We had eight families in there, and there were husbands and wives with kids. 
and we're in this room, and we were all just getting into feelings, getting right, right into it. Confrontation, conflict, that's it. Confrontation, conflict. Confrontation, conflict. Confrontation, conflict. That's what that whole first day was about. So I'm working with this couple, and I'm working with them and their child, and and then I'm working with the mother and the dad, and so mom's on top of the dad, and we have mats out all over the place. Mom's working with the dad. She's on top of the dad. I'm laying right next to him. And he's getting into his feelings, and he's getting into his feelings. And I said to dad, how old were you when your dad left? He, was, he said, three years old. And I said, say, Dad, where are you? And he said, Dad, where are you? I said, say it again. And just at that moment, he just, he just went boo-hoo. I mean, he just dropped into it. But you know what happened right at the same moment? I dropped right into my, my emotional process. Literally at the same moment, he and I both just but, I mean, we just, I mean, like a rap, like the rabbit hole, going down the rabbit hole, we just boo-hooed, we both just broke down, I mean, just boo-hooed, and I'm talking cathartic release, I mean, just boo-hooed, I, I, the, the mom's holding the dad, and I got my arm around the mom, and I'm laying next to the dad, and we're just like, whoa, I mean, golly. I think that was the that was the that was the first time I'd ever had a cry that deep. And it went on for like 15 minutes. You know, and I'm pretty much in a room full of strangers, but when he said, Dad, where are you? That triggered both of us. That triggered his dad's stuff, it triggered my dad's stuff. And here's the thing, the fascinating thing to me is that I had never up until that point, I had never even really given any consideration to my biological father. I thought about my biological mother, but I hadn't even given any consideration to my biological father. And when, when we went there, I mean, we just dropped off into that, and I was like, holy crap. When I came out of that, I mean, I was like, whoa, what the heck? And I remember walking over to, because at that point, Martha had kind of worked through with her family. I remember walking over and just, like, sitting next to her and her, her boyfriend, husband, fiance, Bob, and just like, whoa, what the heck? And she was like, yeah, it happened. You tapped into some of your emotional stuff. I was like, holy crap. That was, I, I was blown away. And that was my second major emotional impacting moment so see at this point I am like fully immersed in attach in the world of attachment I mean it now this has just rocked my world this, this has just shifted my paradigm any kind of play therapy any kind of individual talk therapy any kind of art therapy any kind of music therapy any kind of question therapy any other kind of therapy that wasn't emotionally based, wasn't attachment oriented, just fell away. It just completely fell away. And I remember going back to Oklahoma, because that's where I had my clinics at that time. I remember going back to Oklahoma, and within, within a couple weeks, I had six families in a room doing an intensive and I had trained some therapists, brought some therapists to some training and that was the first time that any any therapist training with Martha had ever done an intensive on their own outside of her. And that was powerful. It, it was it was very powerful. No one was doing it. No one was doing it. I was on fire. I was on fire and from that point uh, then I got nominated to the board of Attach so then now there's Martha and I, which were the, like the biggest proponents of, of her stuff. You know, everyone, at the other side was mostly love and logic. And then in the middle, there were some people who kind of rode the fence with some, with some, uh, was like Dan Hughes, um, you know, his, his shame, his shame work. And uh, he's got a name for it. And then there was um, 
Linda Mays, Todd Nichols, and they they did the a lot of narrative therapy. They did they did a combinations of, ther of therapy. They didn't do any kind of rage reduction stuff, but um. So there was like, you know, the foster client continuum, on one side. That's and Nancy wasn't on the board of Nancy Thomas wasn't on the board of attachment. She was probably, you know, to to not be a therapist herself, she was probably one of other than Foster Klein, one of the most famous uh, love and logic kind of practitioners out there. And she, you know, she had a name for her stuff, but it was based in love and logic. And you know, her, her and Foster Klein had a pretty close relationship. And Greg Keck and um, Bill Goble and you know, just just some real, just some real. Pioneering people, you know, all, all compassionate, all bold, all courageous people doing stuff that no one else was doing. I mean, they 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 just were out there, you know, doing what they thought, and then you know, I have the utmost respect. And I think over the years, attach has kind of changed. Like I said, I haven't been involved, but uh, that's where I started, and then so from there, um, pretty much Martha and I, and, and a small content, contingent of other therapists, we just traveled all around, and now. <laughs> You'll find this historically interesting. So, at one of Mar Martha's big intensives, Heather Forbes came. That's where I first met Heather Forbes, and she came as she came as wanting help for her family because she has adopted children, but. She came first as a therapist and, and just kind of participated in the intensive as a therapist. And then she was, uh, she had asked Martha, apparently, so there was this conflict. I'm, I'm giving you guys some behind-the-curtain stuff. You know, this is probably one of those things I could get sued for, I'm sure. Um, but whatever, you know, it's it's all factual. So Heather had asked Martha, how can I get treatment for my family? And this is the thing, you know, Martha was, she was not resistant to therapists coming with their own family. She encouraged it. But here's the, the other thing is that she really did not, encur she encouraged us as therapists to go home and do holding with our families, which I think most of us did. But it was not required that we come and go through the process with our families. And it, it's probably, it should have been. Because I eventually, my approach eventually was to always start with therapists going through, going through a camp and doing their own work to really understand themselves. And, and there's a whole process for that. I'll, I'll tell you, maybe we'll get to that, how that unfolded too. So Heather was there, and most, some of you may not know who Heather Forbes is, but she was my co-author in the book uh, Beyond Consequences, Logic, and Control. And still doing relatively good work as far as I know. We started the, the um, Beyond Consequences Institute, BCI. So um, if you're not aware, you know, look it up, Beyond Consequences Institute. I don't even know if she still um, offers to the public uh, our first volume, but um, she was there. So Martha said, Heather said, well, how can I get help for my family? Martha said, well, come to an intensive. So she brought her whole family to an intensive and she didn't come as a participating family. She came as a as a therapist, but at some point, she brought her family into the the class, and we started working with her and her family because we thought that Martha had said that this was okay, and apparently there was some miscommunication, and it wasn't. And Martha made them stop and made them leave, you know, kind of right in the midst of getting started. And it, I mean, it was it was very. It was very uh, emotionally painful for Heather because she had brought her family, her entire family, her husband, her two kids from Florida. And I, I heck, I can't even remember where we were. We were in New York. We were in Connecticut. I mean, we traveled all around doing these intensives. So she had brought her whole family. So she was pretty distraught. So we were doing the wrap-up at the end of the, the two days because the intensives always lasted two days. And at the end of the second day, the therapists would all get together and have dinner. And so we were doing the wrap up, and Heather was just so emotionally upset. I remember being outside, just kind of, kind of uh, consoling her. And I didn't really know the woman, but I was, I was, I kind of sat at the right arm of, at the right hand of Martha at that at that point. So, 
Well, I was one of the uh, what would you call, one of the lieutenant one of the the lieutenants in the in the group. And so I was just consoling her, and I said, I'm sure there had been some misunderstanding, but I'd be happy to work with her and her family at any point um, that she wanted to try to arrange it. And so that was my first um, really interaction with Heather. And then a couple years later, I, I don't think I ever saw Heather again after that until I was at an attached conference. And by this point, I'd already kind of broken off, was doing my own thing. And so... I had during the process, so that's Heather Forbes, and that was my my uh, original relationship with Heather Forbes. Um, I had asked Martha's permission, and this is where Martha and I split. I had asked Martha's permission to write a parenting book based on her work because I felt like that was the part that was being missed. She taught about it on her video program, but in an intensive, we never talked about parenting. We never talked about, you know, what do you do when you go home other than you hold. And, and a part of my frustration was that I was going back to my office and I was working with these families and, and we were doing holding and I was, I was, you know, I was coaching them through the process and I was doing great work as far as teaching this model. But with my original family, Casey and his mother, Stacy. And Stacy and Casey, and I can't remember the husband's name. I had even brought them them to an intensive. You know, they'd done several intensives with me. But I remember one day being in their home, being with Stacy and Casey, and Stacy was holding Casey, and she was very frustrated, and I was laying next to him, and I felt stuck. I didn't know where else to go. I'm like, all we've been doing is holding. And it's like I even had this mother and this son. Um, they had... I had, her, I had her put an elastic, a piece of elastic around her wrist and a piece of elastic around his wrist, and they stayed attached, connected to one another for like seven days straight. I mean, it, I mean, we were doing, we were creating attachment, creating attachment, quote, unquote, creating attachment. So elastic, you know, <laughs> around the wrist, around the wrist. You guys are not separate, period. This is your baby. You know, boom, boom, boom. And so I was over there, it's probably on the tail end of that, and, and I was like, we're still holding, we're holding, holding, holding. So I pick up the phone, I'm laying next to the family, and I said, Martha, what, do, what am I missing? What am I missing? And she said, just keep holding. And I knew, I knew in that moment, I said, okay, I knew in that moment something was missing. That I, was something, I wasn't doing something right, something was missing. And so... You know, I continued to work with the family and, and continue to support them. I mean, they, they made, I mean, they made enormous progress and, you know, just, just a, they eventually got to the other side of it. And I, I, I lost track with them, um, a beautiful family. But um, I felt a little disillusioned, but I went to Martha and I said, I want to write a parenting book. And she said, okay. And I said, because I feel, I feel like that's the part that's missing. And um, I feel like it could really enhance what we do. And she said, okay. So I started writing a parenting book. I mean, it was, it was uh, the three, three steps, three steps to attachment or something like that. I can't remember. It was TLC, time, limits, and, and uh, control. Time, limits, and control. I think that's what it was. But I wrote this book. And then I, you know, in the foreword, I was pretty much the one who wrote it. So... I didn't feel like there was any need to like list Martha as a co-author, but in the introduction of, I mean, I loved this woman. I, I loved this woman. I adored. I had ultimate respect for. Her. And I sent the the manuscript after I'd written the book. It was like a hundred pages. I sent it to her, and the next thing I know, I get a call from, you know, like her first lieutenant, this lady Sherry, telling me that. You know, I couldn't publish this book, and Martha wasn't happy that I had written this book and and um, had taken credit for this book, even though you know in the and it, what's what's funny is that you know I gave her all the credit in the in the first section of the book and in the um, what do you call it the acknowledgments I fully acknowledged her, but uh, that apparently wasn't enough, and you know then I got a call from a, another one of her people you know was telling me that I couldn't publish the book what have you and fine and Martha hadn't called me at this point and finally I'm like I got on the phone with her and I'm like what's going on 
and she really didn't say much. She's just like, you know, I, you know, I really, I, I really love you, Brian, and and I, I think it's really good, and and um, I don't know. We just need to, we just need to slow down, and blah 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 blah. And that was my last conversation with Martha. I felt so rejected. I mean, this is, you know, I'm still not real consciously aware of my own stuff at this point. I know there's stuff at this point, but I, I'm, I'm not aware of it. And I felt so rejected by that. I mean, I was like done. So I took the manuscript and I put it up on the shelf. And um, that was the last conversation we ever had. And so that was, that was the loss of a mentor to me. That was the loss of someone who I really loved and, and respected and appreciated. But I had already started moving on. I had started, a friend of mine had introduced me to the work of Alan Shore. So I had started reading Alan Shore's, it, it, you know, again, God's timing. God's timing. I put the manuscript I've written up on the shelf. I had started delving into Alan Shore, which was at a whole other level than, than where Martha was at because he was dealing with affect regulation and, you know, this new science. And I remember my friend Roy Eisenberg saying, Brian, it's all about regulation. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever, Roy. I remember saying that. We were like outside on the steps, and he's like, Brian, I'm reading this Alan Short stuff. He's like, it's all about regulation. And I'm like, whatever. Yeah, I get, yeah, okay. And so, like, you know, six months later, a year later, I'm reading Alan Short stuff, and I'm like, oh my gosh, the light bulbs start to pop on. And that's where I read the uh, little scientific statement. It is believed that affect regulation. Affect regulation is a fundamental mechanism involved in all psychiatric disorders. And I was like, holy crap, this is good stuff. So I started, I began the process of, of massaging what I was doing as a therapist already. And, and I was still using Martha's holding time therapy approach because I, I just didn't, there, for me, my paradigm had changed, so there was nothing else that I, I really felt was effective. And then um, I just began, I just began looking at it, and looking at it, and looking at it, and it started to influence my my parenting because I started looking at regulation as the goal more so than just confrontation, conflict, and resolution. And it just, it started to transform my practice. It, it started to transform my thinking. And so I'm looking, and so during the same time, I start to ask this question. Attachment is, is great. It's a, per, it's a wonderful concept, but what is it that leads to attachment? So I'm reading Alan Shore's stuff. I'm asking this question, what is it that leads to attachment? And I'm in Canada. Or, or I, I'm, yeah. I hadn't even began reading Alan Shore's stuff yet, but I had started asking this question. That's how it happened. I hadn't even begun reading his stuff yet. And I start asking this question, what leads to attachment? And I'm, I'm like, you know, bothered by this question. And, and at the same time, you know, I'm still, I'm still teaching. I'm, I'm traveling around. I'm giving lectures. And I'm still teaching a lot of Martha's stuff. Because I just felt like it was it was the thing, and and I was giving her all the credit and everything that I do, and you know I'm still touting her. I mean, I still loved the woman, still had great respect for. Her. But I started asking this question everywhere I was looking, everywhere I was reading, everything I was talking, every everyone I was talking to, you know, they couldn't really give me an answer. And I remember I wrestled with that question for probably the next couple of years, and I was in Canada, and I was I was working at a treatment home there. And I was on the way to work one morning. It was raining, and I was I was getting ready to go up over this big bridge in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. And that that question that night, like early that morning, had popped into my head. That question, like at three in the morning, I'd woke up, and that question was in my head. And I'd gone back to sleep, and on the way to work, it was rainy, as it oftentimes is in Vancouver. It was rainy, and it was overcast. I remember, I can remember this day. I was driving this little. Uh, um, Honda station wagon. I just loved that station wagon. It was like my dream car. It's a little Honda station wagon. And that question popped into my head, and God said, stress. 
as long as you are stressed, you cannot create attachment. As long as you are stressed, you cannot create attachment. And that's that was a, a seminal moment in my life. Yeah, I mean, people call it a light bulb. To me, it's not a light bulb that goes off. It's God talking to you, and you listen. And if you're open, you hear it. What leads to attachment is the ability not to be stressed. As long as you are not stressed, your system can be opened and you can be connected. And I, I literally almost drove off the road. I almost drove off the road when I heard that and connected to that. And that went right through me and shifted my paradigm and fundamentally took me to the next level. It was the next leap. It was, it was huge. It was significant. And I, I, ca I called. I can't remember who the first person I called was. But I remember within an hour, I had called Roy and said, Roy, it's stress. It's stress. And he starts laughing. He said, yeah, Brian, I told you. It's, it's all about regulation. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I still wasn't getting that it was about regulation. I just connected that it was stress. As long as you're stressed, you cannot be in attachment. As long as you're stressed, you cannot create secure attachment. That's, that's when I formulated the stress model. And that's when I started reading Alan Shore's stuff, and then my whole freaking world just flipped. Oh, my gosh. I mean, it was like, it was a snowball from there. I mean, I was off and running. I dug into Alan Shore. I dug into Daniel Goleman. Emotional intelligence was coming out, and it was just like pop, pop, pop. I was listening to Deepak Chopper one day, and Deepak Chopper said there are only two primary emotions, love and fear. And I was like, oh, my gosh, absolutely. Absolutely. I was at a car wash in Colorado listening to a Deepak Chopra audio program when he said that because at that point I had connected that stress and fear were, were intertwined and interconnected and that there were all these other feelings. So I was, I was already on stress and fear and Deepak said there are only two primary emotions, love and fear, and I was like, boom, that is it. And I, you know, it's just like, boom, boom, it's like, you know, 4th of July, I mean, oh my gosh, I was so on fire, I was so on fire during that time, oh my gosh, and so, at some point in there, I went, I went back home, and I was, I was, it was like 11 o'clock one night, and I don't know what caused me to get inspired, but I pulled my, my um, time limits and control manuscript off the shelf and I started reading it. As I was reading it, I was like, dear God, thank you for not letting me publish this book. Oh, oh my God. I was so thankful because it was so full of fear. It was so full of fear. It was so full of control. It was so full of confrontation. It was so full of fear. I can't tell, I can't, there's nothing else to say. It was so full of fear. The love was not present. And that's where I had struggled. That's where, that's what I was missing. I was missing the love. I had this mom holding and holding and holding this, this child. And we were going through this confrontation. Oh my gosh, it makes me sad just to think about it. And I, I, I felt so inadequate to not, you know, help these families and, and to be feel like I was right on the verge of something. And that's what it was. There was no love. There was no oxytocin. At the end of the day, even though, even though, I was preaching that this, this parenting approach, this therapy approach was love-based. It wasn't. That's what Martha was, used to say. This is a love-based approach. It's different than what they're doing in love and logic. But it wasn't love-based. It was fear-based. The way they dealt with me around that parenting manuscript was fear-based. 
And that's when my practice made another leap. And I went back to those families I'd worked with, and I apologized to every family I, I could reach. I apologized, and I said, we were wrong. I said, we, we were trying to do the right thing, but we were missing it because we weren't creating an opportunity for love. We were creating too much stress. And several of those families, we just changed course. We just changed course, and we, we had got back to teaching love. And you know what? That night, I was sitting there looking at that manuscript at 11 o'clock at night. I started rewriting that manuscript. I rewrote that manuscript all night long, and that became my first parenting book, which was called For All Things a Season. For All Things a Season. And it's, it's not it. We don't even have it in print. I've been wanting to reprint that book again. I've been wanting to rewrite it, add to it. And I haven't. Because, you know, things happen, and I've written and co-written, co-wrote nine other books since then. But I'm going to try to find that book and get that all to you all so you can read it. It's excellent. It's very basic, very basic, very good stuff. And that became my first parenting book. And, and, and then, that, I mean, I had completely broken away from, from any other schools of thought at that point, really. There, were, there was no other school of thought. It became the Brian Post School of Thought. And so a couple years later, I met Heather Forbes again at a at a attached conference, and I was presenting. And so I invited her to come, and she heard what I had to say, and she was fired up, and still not fully believing what it was that I was I was saying. And I remember doing a couple of coaching calls with her, and and uh, she finally got it. It finally connected for her, and so she started training with me and and doing some camps and in, in a lecture in a, at a camp in Virginia Beach. So I stopped. The, the holding, so I went, my, my holding practice transformed also because I got away from the parents. I'd already moved away from the parents doing the confrontation with the child because I, there was something in that that was inherently not okay. And so I was in Yakima, Washington, working with the family, and the dad was holding the son. The dad's holding the son, and he's, he's confronting him at some level. He's confronting him. But he's not confronting him because I had kind of modified it, but I didn't really know for sure what I was doing. So I'm right in the midst of it, and it's starting to get too intense. It's starting to get a little bit aggressive and a little bit violent. And when I say violent, I'm speaking to the energy. Not really the, you know, no one's punching anybody or no one's biting anyone. But um, I checked in with my own body because I'd really started listening to my own body at this point. I checked in with my own body and my feet. I mean, literally, my knees and my feet were balled up. My knees were kind of pulled up. And I looked. I was like, oh, my gosh. And in that moment, again, God said, you're scared. You are afraid. And I immediately relaxed. And I said to Dad, stop. Let him up. And that, that, that was a fundamental shift in my therapy approach. Because I knew then having parents create more stress and anxiety and more fear with their kids was not going to create healing. And that, that I stopped. That was the end of it. So from there, I, I shifted to helping parents get in, touch, get in touch with themselves and their own stuff so they could then teach their children how to get in touch with their stuff. And then with the fundamental premise being that as a parent, if you cannot put your arms around your child, Without it, without, without creating fear, without creating stress, without creating some, some negative situation, then you should not be holding them. A parent should never force hold their child because they are not in touch with what's going on with themselves. So until a relationship has been restored to the point that a child will naturally come and lay in a parent's arms, will naturally come and be with the parent, then there is no business for any kind of holding in a therapy occurring. Because any kind of holding that occurs in, in, a, in a family, in a therapy session should not be confrontational. It should not be punitive. It should not be aggressive. It should not be shaming. It should not create more stress and fear. Bottom line, because if it's creating more stress and fear, it's not creating more oxytocin. So that became my new model. That's what I started. I, I came up with the stress model, and then I just took off from there, started teaching, started doing camps, etc. And then we were at a... It's just yeah, just to give you the bare bones 
behind the scenes. We were at a, a, I was doing a camp in Virginia, and Heather was there, and I was in the midst of doing the camp, and I just had, God said, write a book. And I said, hey, Heather and I are writing a book. And she was like, we are? I was like, yep, and it's going to be everything that is opposite to reactive attachment disorder. Because a parent, I had worked with a family in San Diego, a, a very famous former football player in San Diego, and he had said to me, why don't you write a book that gives a contrary opinion to all of these negative behaviors? He said, because everything out there is completely spinning these behaviors in a way that you're saying isn't correct. And I was like, you know what, that's a good idea. And so I said, Heather and I are writing a book. Of course, she had no idea about it. But after, at the end of the day, we went up to her room and we created the outline to what became Beyond Consequences and Control. That was, that's, how, that's how it was born. And then from there, you know, th things, life changes, life happens, things change, you know. People, people uh, do what they do. And when you're not aware of your own stuff, it's going to influence, it's going to influence you. It just does. And that is, you know, from there, I, I've never wavered. Since then, I've never wavered. Not, nothing, nothing that I've taught, nothing that I've written about has ever wavered about from that fundamentally, whether it was me talking about aggression, whether it's me talking about lying, stealing, defiance, whatever it is, I've never wavered. Because I, I, I know this to be true. I know these things to be true. I don't think. I know them to be true. And that's Brian Post attachment history. <laughs> so I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, obviously, we didn't get to uh, the completion of what we were going to complete in this this parenting approach. So this is what's coming next and in our next class. Let me take this off for a minute. Perfect. We'll cover all these in our next session. And that will conclude today's class. So I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you get something from it. I hope you realize the importance of being a student of any discipline you decide to, to uh, follow, to study. Don't be afraid um, to read it all. Don't be afraid to listen to it all. Just listen to it with, with an openness, with an open heart, and always challenge, always question. And then I, I ultimately, I don't believe you can go wrong. And so thank, thank you all for, for joining me in this class. God bless you, and have a fantastic weekend and a fantastic week.